under the leadership of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imam Ali alayhi salam was with the Prophet every step of the way. When it came to constructing the Masjid of Medina, Imam Ali alayhi salam participated in that. But the first major challenge, my dear brothers and sisters, that the Muslims faced in Medina, year two of the Hijrah, that's two years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi migrated to Medina, was the Battle of Badr. Nearly 1,000 pagans, mushrikeen from Mecca and neighboring tribes, they mobilized a massive army of 1,000 soldiers to go and fight the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ left Medina with 313 of his companions. And they camped at an area called Badr. It had wells. You could go and stock up on water. The Prophet told the Muslims, the next day there's going to be a battle. God had informed him. Are you ready? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. We're ready to defend you. Then the Prophet asked the Muslims, his companions, who can go out in the darkness of the night? It is treacherous out there. It was a cold, windy night to bring us some water. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Ya Rasulullah, I am willing to do that. So Imam Ali السلام, went to the wells of Bad. This is the night before the battle. And he tried to take water. Now when he went to the well, you know, usually they have those buckets attached to a rope that you can pull the water from. Imam Ali realized there was no bucket there with an attached rope. So how is he going to get the water out from the well? But you know what's special about Imam Ali? When the Prophet asks for, asks for something, Ali ibn Abi Talib does not say no. He will go to the extreme to fulfill the request of the Prophet. You know what Imam Ali ended up doing? He took the bucket and he went inside the well. Who does that? Who would risk himself like that? He went inside the well and he took out the water. Now it took Imam Ali a while to go back. So the Prophet asked him when he got to the camp, to the tent, and he brought the water. The Prophet told him, Ya Ali, why did it take you so long? So Imam Ali explained that he had to go inside the well and get the water. But then Imam Ali told the Prophet, when I was coming back, it was very windy. I noticed three times there was such a heavy gust of wind pushing against me. I had to actually stop. I couldn't move. That's how strong the winds were. Three times this happened. That delayed me, Ya Rasulullah. You know what the Prophet said to Imam Ali and those Muslims? The Prophet said, oh Ali, you want me to tell you what was happening there? Your act of sacrifice was so beloved in the eyes of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent three angels to protect you. First is Jibra'il with 1,000 angels. They came saluting you, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and blessing you for this act of sacrifice. Then Mikail came with 1,000 angels. Then another angel came with 1,000 angels. 3,000 angels came to greet you, O Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's why you felt that strong gust of wind. Allahu Akbar. Yes, Allah in the Quran says that 3,000 angels were there at Bad. So this was the night of the battle, the day of the battle. Imagine the Muslims are outnumbered 3 to 1. They're 313. The enemies are... 1,000, the Muslims had only one horse, the enemies had 300 horses. You can imagine, it was no match. On that day, Allah saved Islam through the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib. 70 of the pagans were killed in that battlefield. 35 of them at the hands of Imam Ali. With his courage, with his valor, with his deep faith in Allah, Allah granted the Muslims the first victory in Medina. And that dealt a severe blow to the pagans. It weakened their morale. So Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was the hero of the Battle of Badr. Then they went back to Medina. A while later, about a year later, the Battle of Uhud now occurred. The pagans came now with 3,000 fighters 
to the Mount Uhud area, which is uh, one of the suburbs of Medina today, and they wanted to attack the Muslims. My dear brothers and sisters, the battle of Uhud is a very important battle for us to study. It tells us a lot about those who betrayed the Prophet. Yes, many companions left the Prophet. Read Quran. The Quran says you started fleeing. You don't even look back. The Prophet's calling you. I am the messenger of Allah. The enemies are here. They want to eradicate and uproot Islam. But they fled the battlefield. Only five on that day stayed defending the Prophet. One of them was a woman, by the way. She defended the Prophet. One of them was Abu Dujan al-Ansari, one of the great companions of the Prophet. But the foremost defender was Ali ibn Abi Ghalib, such that his sword broke in this battlefield. He came to the Prophet, he told him, Ya Rasulullah, they're getting very close. My sword broke. At that point, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi took out Saif Dhul Fiqar, the Dhul Fiqar sword, which was a sword given to Prophet Muhammad from Jibra'il. Jibra'il brought, that, brought down the sword. He gave it to the Prophet. The Prophet gave it to Imam Ali. He told him, Ali, fight with this sword. And on that day, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib defended the Prophet. They were this close to killing the Prophet. In fact, there were even rumors spread that Muhammad has been killed. And many of his companions, they actually fled. The Quran rebukes those companions who fled. If you hear that Muhammad is die, has died or he's killed, you flee like that? You turn back on your heels? So Imam Ali السلام, was instrumental in defending the Prophet at the battle of Uhud. Let's honor the sacrifice of Imam Ali, my dear brothers and sisters. This beautiful faith that we have today, we could not have experienced it had it not been for the sacrifices of Imam Ali. But you know how many wounds the Imam sustained? The Imam's body was full of wounds. And it was through the blessing and the prayer of the Prophet that Allah healed Imam Ali instantaneously. Otherwise, the Imam suffered many, many wounds. Now, in those early years in Medina, Many companions came to the Prophet asking for his daughter Fatima. We want to marry your daughter Fatima. The Prophet would say, this matter belongs to God. Allah has to allow and decide and accept who's going to marry my daughter. So finally, a few women came to Imam Ali السلام, such as Um Ayman and others. They told him, oh Ali, what are you waiting for? Why don't you go and propose? Imam Ali was shy. He was so modest. He was shy to go and propose. They told him, oh, Ali, he's not going to give Fatima other than you. We know that. So go and propose. Imam Ali, alayhi salam, finally he goes and he proposes. The Prophet does two things. One, he waits for revelation from Allah. Number two, he asks Lady Fatima, alayhi salam. Once Lady Fatima gives her consent and Allah sends the revelation to Prophet Muhammad that yes, Zawwaj Aliyyam min Fatima. I have now given the permission for you to allow Ali to marry your daughter Fatima. The Prophet gave the final approval and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, he married Lady Fatima salam. The Prophet went into his masjid. He gave a beautiful sermon. And the Prophet actually did the Katb Iktab, the engagement ceremony at the masjid between Imam Ali and Lady Fatima alayhi salam. Now my dear brothers and sisters, about on average, maybe 15, 20 days later, we have different reports. This happened in Dhul Qa'dah of that year. In the next month, you know, the Hijjah, some 20 days later, the wedding happened. And basically, the night before the wedding, the day before the wedding, the Prophet was told that Ali ibn Abi Talib is now ready to have the wedding, to move in with Lady Fatima. My dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet teaches us a very valuable lesson here. And inshallah, our families take this lesson to heart. These days, one of the reasons why we've complicated marriage 
and we actually intimidate many brothers from coming and proposing is the cost of our weddings. We need a year in advance to plan for the wedding. Sometimes we spend 30, 50, $100,000 on the wedding. It's extravagant. And believe me, even many of our weddings, they're not even halal weddings. It's a mixed wedding. Men and women dance in front of one another. And, you know, haram music is played. By the way, usually when, I, when people ask me about this, you know, I give them the advice not to have that dancing and music. <laughs> you know what they say? They say, say it, come on. It's my night. One night in my life, it's my wedding. Let us have some fun. You know what my response to that is, brothers and sisters? Has Allah been a bad Lord to you? Allah has given you the money, the health, the opportunity to get married. Everything you have in that wedding is from Allah. And you want to start that night a beautiful chapter with your spouse. Is it appropriate? That's all I'll say. No more. Is it appropriate to start that night with God's disobedience? Using God's resources to violate His law? That's the only question I'll ask you. So we've made our weddings very difficult for many of the youth today to take on the responsibility of paying for it. I know many brothers, believe me, they're decent, they have good character, they're responsible, they started a job, they're stable, but they're intimidated because they tell you that, you know, if I want to uh, go and get married, the least thing I need $50,000 for the wedding. Because in my culture, the family's not going to settle for anything less than that. It's even considered I. My dear brothers and sisters, let's learn from the wedding of Imam Ali and Lady Fatima. One day before the Prophet was told Ali is ready, the Prophet said, tomorrow we're having the wedding. He didn't say, wait next week and next month and let's make all these preparations. It's okay. Allah puts barakah. They had a simple wedding. The companions, they came, they all participated. The Prophet gave food to everyone in Medina and Allah puts the barakah in that. And so Imam Ali and Lady Fatima, they got married. That night, the Prophet told Lady Fatima, sit on the camel, let me show you to your room. The room of Lady Fatima was just by the mosque of the Prophet, next to his own room. So the Prophet takes Lady Fatima to her room. At the door of the room, one narration states, the Prophet puts the hand of Imam Ali into the hand of Lady Fatima. And he says, oh Allah, bless them. Oh Allah, give them a blessed progeny. And when Rasulullah makes such a dua, we can Im only imagine what kind of progeny they had. And about a year later, we see the fruit of this marriage when Imam Al-Hasan was born. The first grandchild to the Holy Prophet He was born in the most blessed house in the history of humankind. His grandfather is Rasulullah. His father is Ali. His mother is Lady Fatima. Show me a house purer than this in history. So Imam Hassan alayhi salam was born. Then later on, Imam al Hussein was born. Lady Zainab alayhi salam was born. And we see Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib being the father figure to his family. He was so compassionate towards his children. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Lady Zainab. We have beautiful narrations. You know, capturing us that fatherly moment between Imam Ali and Lady Zainab. One narration states that Imam Ali was teaching Lady Zainab how to count. See, the Imams would spend time, quality time with their children. He would tell her, say wahid. She would say wahid, one. Say two. She wouldn't. My dear daughter Zainab, say one, one. Say two. She would not say two. So finally, Imam Ali tells her, how come when I tell you to say one, you say one, you're counting, but you're not saying two. You know what Lady Zainab told her father? She told him, Father Ali, how can I say two with the tongue that said one? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Look at the Tawheed, how Imam Ali and Lady Fatima had instilled Tawheed in Lady Zainab, such that she's young, she's only two, she's only three, she's learning how to count. She says, how can I say two with the tongue that says one, meaning the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a beautiful way to show her father how deeply she believes in the Tawheed of God and the oneness of God. 
So the Imam السلام, had this beautiful family. And on one of those days, the Prophet was amongst Lady Fatima, Imam Ali Hassan and Hussein, when the verse of purification was revealed. The Prophet put them under the cloak, the Yemeni cloak, and there were five Ashab al Kisa, the people of the cloak. And the Prophet made this, that, that dua, Oh Allah, these are my Ahlul Bayt. These are my family. Whatever hurts them, hurts me. Whatever brings them joy, brings me joy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them that day with verse 33 of Surah Al-Ahzab. Verse 33, chapter 33. So Imam Ali was part of the Ahlul Bayt that were purified. My dear brothers and sisters, many events happened in Medina. One of the titles that the Prophet gave to Imam Ali during those days of Medina was Abu Turab. The Prophet went to the expedition called Dat al Ashira. So, according to this hadith, one day he saw Imam Ali and Ammar ibn Yasir sleeping on the dust. See, Imam Ali well, didn't have a fancy lifestyle. No, I need to have a comfortable bed for me to sleep. It's, it's time to sleep, he would sleep. It's okay even if it's on the desert sand. So the Imam was sleeping on the desert sand and the dust had collected on his face. The Prophet came to wake him up. He saw him in that state. So the Prophet told him, Qum ya Aba Turab, Stand up, O the father of dust. Imam Ali loved this title. I am the father of dust. It shows the humility it shows the humbleness of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And by the way, we're all created from dust, from clay. And if Imam Ali is the father of dust, he is the father figure of all of people and humankind. That's an honorary title, my dear brothers and sisters, that the Prophet gave to Imam Ali. And he loved this title, the father of Turab. Many other battles happened, my dear brothers and sisters. I'll just briefly mention two. The first one was the Battle of Khandaq, or also known as the Battle of Ahzab. This is before the seventh year of the Hijrah. This is about year five or six of the Hijrah when the Prophet was in Medina. So the pagans had mobilized their armies to come and fight the Prophet inside the city of Medina. They wanted to ransack and besiege the city of Medina. So the Prophet and the Muslims, they dug a trench a deep trench, Khandaq, to protect themselves from the attacks of the pagans. One of those pagans was known to be a warrior. He was a skilled warrior. His name was Amr ibn Wud. He managed to actually jump with his horse across this very, very wide trench. He managed to get to the Muslim side. Once he got to the Muslim side after this act, this heroic act of jumping over the ditch, he said, who's willing to come and fight me? The Muslims at the time, the Holy Quran describes their state. You know, they, they were shivering out of fear. It's as if their hearts were coming out of their throats. They even, some of them doubted that Allah is going to protect them on that day. Are we even on the truth? You know, is God going to really protect us? The Prophet called on his companions at the Battle of Khandaq. He told them, who amongst you is willing to get up and fight Amr ibn Wud? And I will guarantee Jannah for him. No one got up except young Ali in his 20s. Ya Rasulullah, I am willing. The Prophet said, second chance. Which of the companions is willing? Ali said, Ya Rasulullah, I am. Three times the Prophet calls on his companions, but no one had the courage of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam Ali got up, he said, I will, Ya Rasulullah. So the Imam Ali salam, he goes, that man is a warrior. Physically, he is bigger than Imam Ali. He's got those muscles, older than Imam Ali. Imam Ali was in his early 20s, but the Imam, through his amazing act of courage, the Imam السلام, strikes him. Now, the Muslims are watching. Ali ibn Abi Talib is coming to kill that man. 
Now, by the way, the imam, before killing him, he did invite him. He told him, stop the war, stop your you know, aggression, and we'll, we, we, we do want to have peace. He says, no, I'm here to fight and kill. So the imam had no choice but to kill him. They realized that before the imam was about to finish him off, he got up. The imam got up. He took a walk around his body. Then he went back. And then he killed him. So when he went back to the Muslims, they asked him, Oh, Ali, why did you do that? You know what the imam said according to this narration? He said, when I was next to him, about to finish him off, he spat on my face. So I got angry. But then I reminded myself, Ali, you're killing him for the sake of God, for the sake of justice. Not because now he made you angry. Because when you get angry, you want to seek revenge from someone. So I got up until the anger subsided. And then I killed him sincerely for justice. Sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Who is like Ali in his discipline? Then the Prophet gave him the Medal of Honor. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi stated, ضَرْبَةُ عَلِيٍّ يَوْمَ الْخَنْدَقِ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الثَّقَلِينَ the strike of Ali on the day of Khandaq is better than the worship of all of humankind. And then came the battle of Khaybar, my dear brothers and sisters. The bat See, all those battles, Islam was able to defend itself through the blessings of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the battle of Khaybar came through Imam Ali. Allah gave them victory. And then year seven, you had the conquest of Mecca. When the Prophet entered Mecca triumphantly, one of the companions of the Prophet, he took the banner and he entered Mecca. Remember, people in Mecca had blood on their hands. For 20 years, they had been fighting the Prophet and persecuting and killing the Muslims and rejecting the signs of God. So this man, he went and he said, He told the people in Mecca, get ready. Today, is when you will be chopped up. Today is when your women will be taken as prisoners. But that's not the banner of Islam, my dear brothers and sisters. That's not the slogan of Islam. Islam is a religion of peace. The Prophet told Imam Ali, told him, Imam Ali, you go take the banner. Oh Ali, what this guy is saying does not reflect my teachings. Ali, I want you to go and make the announcements in, in Mecca. You know what Imam Ali said? al yawmul marhama. Today is the day of peace, mercy. Today, your women shall be protected. No, we're not here to take your women as prisoners of war or to kill you. When the Meccans heard that, they felt safe. That's Muhammad is not here to seek revenge. And the Prophet in Mecca did not kill a single person. He told him, I have freed you. So we find Imam Ali reflecting that mercy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then, my dear brothers and sisters, we go three years later. Now, many events happened here, but for the sake of time, we want to briefly examine the biography of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Three years later, the Prophet mobilized his companions for the final Hajj. This year, I'm going to Hajj. I want Muslims to join me. Over 100,000 Muslims at the time joined the Prophet. This is year 10 of the Hijrah, two months before the Prophet passed away. The Prophet goes to Hajj. Imam Ali is with him. On his way back from the Hajj, they stop at a point called Ghadir Khum. It was at Ghadir Khum that the Prophet took the hands of Imam Ali in front of 120,000 Sahaba. And he said, Man kuntu mawla, Whomever I'm his guardian, Ali yun mawla. Ali is now his guardian. Allahumma wali man wala. Wa'adi man ada. Wansur man nasra. Oh Allah, be the guardian of the one who follows Ali. Oh Allah, be the supporter of the one who supports Ali ibn Abi Talib. You want Allah to support you, my dear brothers and sisters? Support Imam Ali and the teachings of Imam Ali. Because the Prophet made a dua, Oh Allah, support whomever supports Ali ibn Abi Talib. But then, unfortunately, when the Prophet passed away, some of those companions, they gathered, they betrayed Imam Ali. And they took the Khilafah from him. Now, there's many incidents here that happen. Inshallah, next week when we examine the life of Lady Fatima, we will mention some of them briefly. But Imam Ali was marginalized. His house was attacked. 
He was marginalized from the Khilafah for 25 years. Effectively, Imam Ali, after the Prophet, for 25 years he was under house arrest. He was commanded by the Prophet to be patient. You know, it's very difficult to be patient. The Prophet told him, if you see the Muslim Ummah betraying you, not supporting you, then avoid bloodshed. Then be patient for the sake of Allah to maintain that unity so that the enemies don't destroy the religion of Islam. So Imam Ali السلام, had to be patient. By the way, Imam Ali had a lot of activities during those 25 years. It's not like he was sitting at home doing nothing. He did a number of things. One of them, during the 25 years, the Imam Ali would go to a nearby a village called Yambur. It's right on the coast of the Red Sea today. From Medina, if you go west to the Red Sea, there's a place called Yambur. The Imam Ali salam would develop farmlands with his own blessed hands. He would work. He, would not, he was not arrogant and say, I'm an Imam, why should I work? The Imam would work with his own hands. So the Imam Ali salam during those 25 years, he planted 100,000 trees, palm trees. Allahu Akbar. And then those dates from the palm trees would be sold and he would give the poor and the orphans money from this. He would fund charitable projects. Let's learn from the Imam alayhi salam, subhanAllah. How the Imam teaches us to work. How the Imam teaches us the spirit of entrepreneurship and to also support charitable projects. Then 25 years later, everyone gathered uh, at Imam Ali's place and they told him, we want you to be the Khalifa. So they chose and selected the Imam Khalifa. He was the only Khalifa he was, who was democratically elected. But during those four years, my dear brothers and sisters, many wars happened against Imam Ali, civil wars, instigated by Talha, Zubair, and Aisha. The first of them was the Battle of Jemen. A massive army gathered to fight Imam Ali, alayhi salam. And then Muawiyah fought Imam Ali with over 100,000 people at Safin. And then the Khawarij, they fought Imam Ali at the Battle of Nahrawan. These are three critical battles <coughs> that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, had to endure. But he was patient for the sake of Allah. The Imam really went through much, so much. But the Imam's goal was justice, my dear brothers and sisters. I'll conclude by briefly telling you some of the achievements of Imam Ali while as a ruler. If you look at the letter of Imam Ali to Malik al-Ashtar, who was, who was his governor in Egypt, the Imam lays out the policies, the economic policies of his government. You know, today we have the welfare system. Well, guess what? 14 centuries ago, Imam Ali is the one who started the welfare system. He tells Malik al-Ashtar, those who are disabled, give them a monthly salary because they're disabled. They can't work. At the time, people didn't even consider uh, disabled people to be full citizens. You know, they were treated second-class citizens. Then the Imam says, those who are stuck in poverty, they're really trying, but they can't help them out. A woman who's divorced or a widow, she has no one to take care of her. You put her on the payroll from the public funds. Subhanallah, look at the justice of Imam Ali. Number two, the Imam was big on saving resources and protecting the environment. He told his governors, when you write me letters, avoid any unnecessary <coughs> talk, get to the point. So you save space and, and paper. Use pens that are sharp because if the font is very fine, you can put more words in that page, right? And the Imam says, don't leave gaps between the lines. Subhanallah, look at the Imam. At that time, when people had no understanding of the environment, the Imam tells his governors, save space. Don't even waste a single line on a piece of paper. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. And as for the Imam's sponsorship of orphans, as for Imam's ibadah, the Imam had a nightly routine of ibadah. You know, in the month of Ramadan, when the Imam was in Kufa, he had a nightly habit. During the day, the Imam was a warrior. At night, he would cry. 
he would cry for the orphan. He would cry for himself. He would cry out of love for Allah. And I'd like to conclude by capturing this dua that the Imam would recite uh, in Masjid al-Kufa when he was a Khalifa. Remember, the man is a Khalifa. He's the ruler. On today's map, that's over 50 countries. But the Imam at night, he would sit. He would remember the Day of Judgment. These nights, my dear brothers and sisters, read Munajat Imam Ali in Masjid al-Kufa. I urge you, tonight read it. He says, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-aman. Oh Allah, I ask you for safety. Why, O oh Ali? What do you want safety for? Which day? Allahumma inni as'aluka al-aman. Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. Oh Allah, I ask you for aman on a day where nothing will help. No wealth, no, no children. Your money is not going to help you there. Children are not going to help you there. If you have a big family, just because you have a big family, it's not going to help you there. So what will help you? Except if you go to Allah with a sound, pure heart. A pure heart on the day of judgment will save you. A heart <coughs> that is free from hypocrisy, that is free from jealousy, from arrogance, this will save you on the day of judgment. Oh Allah, I ask you for aman, safety. On that day, when those who did acts of injustice, they will bite at their hands. Regretful. Why did I not listen to the Quran? Why did I not listen to the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ? Why did I associate with bad friends and they distracted me from the path of Allah? It will be a day of regret. The Imam says, Oh Allah, save me from that. He says, Oh Allah, I want you to give me safety on that day. You run away from your brother, your parents, your siblings. The day of judgment is so severe, so serious. We run away from one another. All we want to do is pass and have Allah forgive us. So the Imam السلام, beautifully would cry out of love for Allah. And then he would say, Mawlaya, ya Mawlaya. Anta al-Mawla wa ana al-Abd. Wa hal yarhamu al-Abda illa al-Mawla. He says, oh Allah, you're the master and I'm the slave. And who other than the master can have mercy on the slave? Mawlaya, ya Mawlaya. Oh Allah, my master, you are the rich and I am the poor. And who other than the rich can have mercy on the poor? So we find Imam Ali's life during the day busy, establishing justice, treating everyone equally, serving people. He would see a woman carrying goods and it was heavy. The Imam would give her a hand. The Imam would help her. And he was the governor, the ruler. During the day, he helps the people. At night, he would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until, my dear brothers and sisters, the 19th of Ramadan came. Once the Prophet was giving a sermon about the month of Ramadan, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib told him, Ya Rasulullah, ma afdalu al-a'mal fi hadha al-shah. What's the best thing to do in Ramadan? The Prophet told him, Ya Ali, al-wara'u an maharim Allah. O oh, Ali, to protect yourself from sins, your eyes, your ears, your hands, your tongue, protect it from sin. That's the best thing to do. Then you know what the Prophet said? Then the Prophet started to cry. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, what makes you cry? He says, Ya Abu Hassan, it will be in the month of Ramadan when the most evil enemy of God is going to strike you. And you will die a shaheed in the month of Ramadan. While in the masjid, while in your salah. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib tells him, Ya Rasulullah, when I will be struck, will I be on the right path? Will I be full of iman? The Prophet said, yes, Ya Ali. Imam Ali said that I have nothing to fear. And that's why when he was on the masjid, 
inshallah, next week we commemorate the tragedy of Imam Ali. In about 10 days, the 19th of Ramadan. That's why when Imam Ali was in a salah in the masjid, and that man comes from behind him, Ibn Muljam, and he strikes Imam Ali on his head. <laughs> Imam Ali said one statement. He said, oh Allah. oh Allah, I have now achieved victory. He was 63 years old. A life full of sacrifice, full of difficulty. And he was betrayed so much after the Prophet. Imam Ali missed going back to Allah. And he had said, when is it time? When is it time for me to go back to my Lord? Salamullah alayk ya Abba al-Hasan. Salamullah alayk ya Amir al mumineen We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the shafa'a of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and to illuminate our hearts and minds with the light and the teachings of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So my dear brothers and sisters, we've examined very briefly the biography of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. I'm not sure what time it is, how much time we have, but inshallah, if you have any questions now, we will open the floor uh, to addressing your questions. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Thank you for that beautiful lecture, Sayyid. I can't think of a better way of reflecting on our characters, Muslims, as like listening and learning about the characters of the most noble of Muslims. Um, as we wait for people uh, to ask questions, there is a question a little off topic, but maybe we can answer it as we wait. Uh, are you okay with that? Yes, I'm okay, okay with that. Go ahead. So the question is, if I'm praying long Salat Nafila and there are five minutes left uh, for Adhan, can I stop praying, drink water, and then continue from the same point I stopped? So now when it comes to the Salah of the Nafila, if you stop it and you go and drink water, that will invalidate the Salah. But what you can do is, if there's just five minutes to the Adhan or the Imsak, you don't have to do the full Nafila. You can shorten the Nafila. The test, let's say you're praying Salat al -Layl. And you're doing the 70 uh, istighfars. And you notice that you just have a few minutes and you need to drink water. It's okay. Instead of saying 70, say it 77 times. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. The Quran says, Man ja'a bil hasanati falahu ashra thalaha. If you do one good deed, Allah multiplies it by 10. So say, oh Allah, I'm doing seven. I'm in a hurry. You make it 70. And then continue the nafila quickly and then go and drink water. But if you stop the nafila, you go and you drink water, come back. You can't continue from where you left off because salah has a continuous state. If that continuity is broken, you need to start it over again. Thank you. Okay, so our first question is, how can we gain patience within our social cir circles? For example, negative ones, judgmental ones. Um, are there any specific stories of Imam Ali that we can gain some, uh, I guess they're asking, any power from? Imam Ali alayhi salam, was the symbol of patience indeed. Here are a few quick tips we learned from his legacy to be patient in those circumstances. Number one, prepare yourself. Tell yourself beforehand that Allah is trying me in this world. Allah is monitoring my behavior, my actions. And it is a given that someone in society is either going to tick me off or is going to judge me, or is going to frustrate me. Just tell yourself every day that this is expected. Telling yourself that will give you patience. See, if you're, if you're going to a play, you're an actor in a play, and you look at the script, and you're told that halfway throughout the script, there is a scene where someone comes and ticks you off, frustrates you, and this is how you have to respond. So you know what the script is, right? Well, if you go to the play and you're acting and halfway this person comes and ticks you off, are you going to really get angry? No. Why? Because you know it's a play. You're prepared. My dear brothers and sisters, life, even if it's 80 years long for us, 90, 100, it's a play. Allah's the producer. You're the actor. Allah's monitoring you. He's giving you a score 
on your performance. That in itself gives you a lot of patience. Imam Ali alayhi salam teaches us that Allah is with you. He's watching. It's okay. You go out in the morning and you meet people. Tell yourself that it's a given. Someone's going to try to frustrate me somehow. It's going to be my wife, my husband, my children, my siblings, my colleagues, my friends, somebody random in the street. Somebody's going to tick me off. Be prepared. Simply preparing yourself psychologically will give you mountains of patience. So that's a, a, strategy, a, a, a strategy that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would teach us. Imam Ali salam would always remind himself that Allah is watching. I am doing this for Allah. As long as he's watching and I got the score, I'm satisfying Allah, it doesn't matter. If others are going to frustrate me, it's okay. Many people would insult Imam Ali salam. But the Imam would always maintain his akhlaq. The Imam would not stoop to their level. You know why? Because he wasn't dealing with them. They were not objects of his transaction. You know who was his object of transaction? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was the object of his transaction. As long as I'm doing it for Allah, that's it. It's enough. I'll share this uh, interesting uh, question that a sister asked me. Once a sister asked me, she was very frustrated. She told me, say it. I work 24-7 every day of the week so hard for my husband at home. He does not appreciate what I do. He doesn't even say thank you to me. He's so unappreciative. And I work for him day and night. So tell me, what can I do to be patient? I told her, you're working 24-7 for who? She said, for my husband. I do everything. At home, day and night, serving him, serving the house, doing chores. But he doesn't appreciate it. I told her, you're working for your husband day and night? She said, yes, yeah, yeah. I told her, well, it's your fault. Who told you to work for your husband? Your husband is a human being who's a weak being just like you. Why are you working for him day and night? Now, she was surprised. She thought, I'm going to tell her it's okay. Yeah, it's mustahab. Work for your husband. Obey your husband. She was not expecting that from me. I told her, no, you don't work for your husband. You work for Allah. Who's your husband for you to work for him? Allah, you work for him. When you work at home, your niyyah is for God. If you do a good act of kindness to your husband, it's for Allah. And Allah appreciates what you do. Whether your husband appreciates or not, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, he should appreciate, but you didn't lose your reward. Your reward is with Allah. Imam Ali teaches you, make the object of your transaction Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That way, when you leave this world, you can say like him, Fustu wa Rabbil Ka'bah. Because now, I'm going back to the, this Lord whom I served my entire life. Thank you, Sayyid. Um, the next question, before we get to, there are also two questions, one about the Holy Quran and one about Salat. So before we get to that, regarding the lecture, is the importance of Sayyida Fatima uh, that she is the daughter of the Prophet or is it because she is chosen from God as one of the women in Islam? Why? What is especially special about her? The Prophet had other daughters. Ruqayya, for instance, Zainab. The Prophet did have other daughters from Lady Khadija. So Fatima السلام, is not special just because she is the Prophet's daughter. Obviously, it's an honor that she was the Prophet's daughter. But that's not why we follow her and we hold her so dearly to our hearts. Lady Fatima special is because she was infallible, chosen by Allah. Given her young age, she demonstrated that she was infallible. She was knowledgeable. She was compassionate. She was an excellent wife, excellent daughter, excellent mother. She's a role model for humanity. The level of sincerity that she had, her service to her neighbors, her acts of donations to the poor. Lady Fatima was at the peak of the peak. The purity of her heart was impeccable, unmatched in history. She was second to the Prophet ﷺ and Imam Ali in the purity of her heart. So we love Lady Fatima so much, not because she was just the Prophet's daughter, but because she indeed passed the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he tried her before he created her in the world of souls, and also here in this world, uh, she passed the test. That's why in her ziyara, 
we find the following ya mumtahana imtahanaki allah alladhi khalaqaki qabla an yakhluqaki fawajadaki lil mumtahanaki sabira we say oh fatima even before god put you in this physical world allah tried your soul and he found you to be patient lady fatima was the symbol of patience so that's why she's special okay now uh the question about the quran it says do you get the same benefits of reading the quran in the english translation instead of arabic it's very important to know the meanings of quran so it's highly recommended to read the english translation if you recite the english translation you definitely get ajr however do you get the same effect as reading it in arabic I'll be very honest with you. Reading it in Arabic has a greater effect. You know why? Because Arabic, when you read the Quran in Arabic, that's the actual words of God. The English translation is not the actual word of God. It's someone's understanding of the Quran. It's a translation of a human being. And when you read the very, you know, direct words of God, the impact that they have on your heart, on your mind, on your spirituality is definitely great so there is a reward for reciting the quran in english it counts as contemplating the quran you should do that in the month of ramadan but if you have the opportunity to learn arabic even if it's at a basic level just to understand some words i highly encourage you to do that so read the english translation then after that read some arabic verses pronounce them in arabic read them in arabic they have a profound impact on your soul because the arabic is the actual words of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thank you uh the next question is about prayer uh why do we group our prayers time together can we do them separate or uh we have to do it together the the quran tells us that the three main times for salah are three aqim as-salata luduluk ash-shams pray at the time of duluk ash-shams which is midday dhuhr إلى غسق الليل at night when it's dark وقرآن الفج and the فج these are the three primary times now we have five salats in the school of أهل البيت it's optional for us to either join the prayers together ظهر and عصر pray them at the same time مغرب and عشاء or you can separate them it's optional you can choose what works with your schedule so you can pray ظهر at let's say 1 p.m. And then a couple of hours later, an hour later, three hours later, you can pray Asr. Or you can pray them together. So that is optional. Now, it's highly recommended to separate between the prayers with at least a dua. See, some people, they pray in dhuhr. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. They get up, Allahu Akbar Asr. It's better not to do that. Put some sort of distance between dhuhr and asr even if you're doing tasbihat al-zahra even if you're doing duas in the month of ramadan we have beautiful duas ya aliyu ya azim ya ghafur ya rahim allahumma rabbi shahri ramadan recite a short dua and then get up do the asr or do a nafila between them as long as you've done a dua or you've done the nafila between dhuhr and asr technically you have separated between them and it is mustahab to to separate them this way So in the school of Ahlul Bayt, it's optional. The Prophet, sometimes he would combine the prayers, sometimes he would separate them. I know Ahlul Sunnah, they, in their fiqh, they have to separate between them unless there's rain or there's, they're traveling, then they can combine. But when we look at the legacy of the Prophet and the life of the Prophet, we see sometimes, and this is mentioned in Sunni sources, sometimes there was no rain, the Prophet was not traveling, yet he would combine between the prayers. So, basically it's optional you can combine or you can put a distance between them but it's mustahab to put distance between them even if it's just a short dua that you do or tasbihat al-zahra that would qualify too thank you um and now maybe we can end with another question regarding the lecture it's from our younger viewers it says how was the guy who struck uh, imam ali after he killed him Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish him or did he feel guilty? Uh, yeah, or did he feel guilt? See, basically what happened with uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he came to the battlefield and Amr ibn Wud was confronting him. Imam Ali alayhi salam initially, 
He invited him to the path of guidance. Stop your aggression. Stop the injustice. He said, no, I'm here to fight. The Imam told him, it's okay. Accept the truth. Let's be friends. Be a Muslim. He said, no, if, if I back off right now, everyone's going to, you know, call me a coward. You know, call me a chicken. You chickened out. So the man demonstrated to Imam Ali that he does not want to accept guidance and he wants to fight. So Imam Ali السلام, struck him. Imam Ali struck him with a sword. He fell to the, to the ground. So Imam Ali came sitting on his chest to kill him when that man spat on the face of Imam Ali. So Imam Ali felt insulted, right? He was enraged because when someone spits in your face, you feel angry. So the Imam wanted to kill him, but he said, let me wait. Not that he was guilty, no. The Imam knew that this was an enemy who was, see if Imam Ali had left, this man would have went and killed the Prophet and the Muslims. He was there to cause destruction. So Imam Ali had to kill this criminal. But the reason why the Imam got up, he waited a while, is so his anger goes away. So the Imam does not kill Amr ibn Wut for a personal reason. Like you, you spat in my face, now I'm gonna kill you, no. The Imam wanted to show Muslims, look, it's about principle. I'm not killing him because he spat in my face or he angered me. No, I am killing him because he's a criminal and I want to establish justice. And this man is stopping justice. So it was to show that the message of Imam Ali and the message of Islam is not a personal problem with people. No, it's about justice. You work for justice, you're with us. But if you repeatedly try to fight justice and you're a criminal, and you want to kill innocent lives? Then no, we have to stop you. So it was not a feeling of guilt that Imam Ali had. Basically, he was just trying to show this point that I'm not killing him for personal revenge. I'm killing him for the sake of Allah. And how about the man who struck Imam Ali salam, who killed him? Yes, so Amr ibn Wood in that yeah. same, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you mean Ibn Muljam who killed Imam yeah, Ali? I, I, think, I think that's what they're referring to, they commented again. Okay, okay, sorry about that. So the question is, that man, did he feel guilt? Yes, what was his punishment after that? Okay, so basically what happened is, when he struck Imam Ali, Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, they captured him, of course, the guards, they captured him. They brought him to the Imam. The Imam Ali salam said, as long as I'm alive, I will decide what happens to him. The Imam Ali salam said, don't kill him. Feed him from my food. SubhanAllah, look at the compassion of Imam Ali. This man came to kill him. He's his murderer. The Imam says, the milk that you bring me, I want you from that same cup to give him. Then the Imam says, if I die, if I happen, you know, to die because of the strike, then my son Hassan, he has the right to serve retribution. If you see fit to forgive him, you can forgive him. But if you see that this man is dangerous on society, he might commit another crime, then kill him with one strike. He struck me once, you strike him once. So after Imam Ali was martyred, they did kill Ibn Muljam. Yes, he was struck once. And basically he was killed because he was a criminal and he did not repent. Even during those last moments, he had no guilt. He was a criminal who was an enemy of God who had no guilt and he did not ask even for repentance. So yes, after Imam Ali passed away, they had Ibn Muljam killed. Thank you so much, Sayyid, for answering our questions. It was a pleasure as always. And um, maybe you can lead us Thank out. Thank you. The May Allah bless you, my dear brothers and sisters. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring you closer to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Believe me, the closer you get to them, the more your heart will feel at rest, the more you will find strength in your everyday life to do that which is good. I ask Allah to bless you in this holy month of Ramadan, to keep you all safe. I know New York got hit hard, but you're all troopers and heroes. And inshallah, I know that the curve is going down for you. So that's a good sign. May Allah give patience to all those families who struggled with COVID-19. But we don't lose hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to remove this affliction soon, inshallah. It's a trial. We're learning a lot during these times, many valuable lessons. Believe me, some communities have even got closer to one another in these times of crisis. 
So support your community, appreciate your family. And once again, a Rahman School Project, I urge all of you to support this wonderful project that's serving you, your families, and your youth, your children. I will keep you all in my du'as. Inshallah, we'll see you next Saturday as we continue our series in examining the lives of the Ahlul Bayt. Next Saturday, we will examine the life of Lady Fatima alayhi salam because she is part of the infallible Ahlul Bayt. And then after that, we'll look at Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, and all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. May Allah bless you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.